Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of Merlin's Monsters, the behind-the-scenes podcast for Murphy. I'm your host, Alexandra Monroe, and I'm joined today by the other writers of Murphy, Annie V. Hello. Derek Sherry. Hello. And Drew Burt. Hello there. In the studio with us today is one of our actors who you've heard in episodes one and two as Samuel Taylor and Phyllis Berger, respectively. He also voices other roles you'll be able to hear in the coming episodes of Murphy, because you haven't heard the last of him. I'm happy to introduce our good friend, Lucas Yedman. Hello, That's Lucas. me. Hello. Yay. Yay. Very happy to be here. Um, <laughs> applause track. Yes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Do, um, do the generic, like, laugh background. <laughs> uh, Can we get a Wilhelm scream in here, please? <laughs> God, great start. Uh, yes. Hi, Lucas. Hello. Um, I guess, like, my first question would be, like, what drew you to acting and voice acting um, and what also drew you to Murphy, to audition for Murphy? So for acting, um, it's kind of what I've been surrounded with my entire life. Um, my mother is a New York casting director uh, and my father is an actor. Um, you know, I would always go into, you know, for like bring your child into work day and whatever, you know, just go into the booth and watch my parents like do their thing. Um, you know, they have their own wonderful, wonderful history of just, um, you know, doing this for so many years, uh, and just watching that. Um, I mean, you know, you want to say like, oh, it inspired me and whatever, but that was like very we, like, yeah, I probably didn't think that complicated, but Honestly, at its core, it the reason why I do love acting is the reason that I loved it when I was a little one. In that, it's the um, it's the childlike sense of play. Honestly, that you get to retain uh, no matter how old you get. Um, and specifically, voice acting that is the realm that um, my mother and father uh, stayed around of just watching your that's, your face going like mm. that's so wholesome. <laughs> yeah. I love thank that. Thank you, though. thank you. Um, but yeah, the the voice over world is is what. You know, my mom and dad uh, were around, you know, um, uh, as I've told some of you before, my um, mother heads a company called Just Voices, um, and uh, she has worked with an insane myriad of people uh, throughout the years, uh, including Lin-Manuel Miranda, uh, the late Chadwick Boseman, and... Um, you know, uh, I think Mark Hamill might be in there. Uh, I just didn't, I didn't know that. That's, I didn't. That's I, crazy. I yeah. knew, like... They were deep in, like, you know, the oh, industry, yeah. but I didn't know how Well, because you deep. have to remember a lot of these people before they got big, you know, did plenty of other voiceover work. You know, yeah. they would do commercials and stuff, and especially uh, plenty of Broadway actors when they weren't uh, in contract for a show. They were um, also just, you know, uh, doing plenty of um, auditions for other things and whatever, just trying to supplement the income and everything. Um, but, yeah, you know, there's... Uh, J.K. Simmons was a big one as well. Um, that was, I actually, I think I've been to his house when I was uh, a little. Well, what? Yeah. what? Yeah. Um, J.K. Simmons, where are you? <laughs> the exact address of that house. You know, if I could remember it, then I'm sure we'd all have J.K. Simmons, time. if you're listening, <laughs> we will find you it's, and we will ask for a job. I believe it's one, two, three, Nanya. Nanya, dang business. Um, but yeah, so I've just, um, on top of, you know, being surrounded by that world in and of itself, um, I've always just been a big nerd, um, in and of itself. Uh, I, uh, you know, I've watched, uh, anime, I play video games, I, uh, watch animation, uh, Western animation, and, you know, all the things that would, uh, have, uh, all these, you know, voice actors that I uh, aspire to be and, and watch and go, wow, that is awesome it's cool you know like <laughs> to um still be able to be a kid essentially to play around and be silly because that's what i did when i was young i um i would play imagination games with my friends um i you know would make up all kinds of stories um and such which funny enough inevitably turned into my dungeons and dragons addiction but yeah uh, as for murphy i um I remember because we all have kind of a group chat and I'm the only one from our group chat that was not part of the main uh, production side of things because it was it was COVID when we were really just starting this. Um, and, you know, I uh, thought about being a writer, but it just was mentally kind of overwhelming for me at the time. And I was like, I still want to be a part of this project. Um, and then as time went on uh, and all of you uh, reached out to me, I, you know, 
I mean, the concept in and of itself was really, really cool. Uh, because I knew uh, each and every one of you, and now it's, the, I guess, time to turn the um, tables on all of you. Uh, mm-hmm. I knew each and every one of you were very talented in each of your own rights. And I, uh, with your collective thoughts uh, put into one room, um, either two things would happen. Um, you would create a fantastic product or uh, you would all fucking kill each other. Um, <laughs> so... I see four live bodies with me today, so, <laughs> you know. Um, you didn't try hard enough. That's you yeah, didn't, you definitely... didn't. Yeah, I mean, you know, of course I I want, would have loved to be a part of the project from the beginning, but I know, um, you know, I've seen this from its iteration. I feel, you know, I feel kind of special and unique uh, among the uh, other actors in seeing where this has come from, from its very, like, inception, um, and to be a part of that process and, you know, uh, to play all these various different interesting characters, especially uh, me as a as an actor. I I love playing antagonists. I fucking love playing antagonists um, and, and weirdos and, you know, things that allow me to just go broad and uh, bizarre. And, you know, you guys have certainly um, given me the space to do that. Um, how did you come up for the, because I, I would say more so for Phyllis than for Sam, because Sam is skeevy, but not as um, skin-crawlingly skeevy as Phyllis is. How did you come up with that? Like, where'd that voice come from? The Phyllis Fred? one. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> there is a very direct inspiration. Uh, has anyone here seen Fargo? Oh, yes. God, like the, long the, time. Show. Yeah, the show. The show. Oh, oh, the show. No, only like two episodes. So I believe it is in the uh, third season. Um, there is, uh, oh, God, what is his name? David Thwales. Uh, yeah. No, Th- um, Thulis. Th- Thulis. Um, David Thulis, yes. Uh, so his character in the third season for that is this, like, grimy, like, you know, he's, um, he's a acts a kind of posh but not really because he's just always like either picking his teeth or he's just you know like breathing on things in just the most disgusting manner um and whenever i pick picture uh phyllis i picture david thulis like i picture david thulis doing the this this just weird like gross character um and that's how i imagine phyllis because i always imagine him to be um, you know, uh, someone that, and that's where I, I, I came up with the regal type of voice for it. It's, um, I imagine him as someone, I've talked to you about it. <laughs> I know, I just kind of <laughs> dipped right too into it. Um, and I just made everyone in this room uncomfortable. I can see, you all can't see the faces, but I can, and it gives me so much life. Um, but. You've done your job. I've done yeah, my you, job. You deaf, yeah. you deaf do um, do. But, you know, I imagine uh, Phyllis as someone who wants to be in a position of power or someone who, a spot, he is kind of the guy who like watches the royal family with like oh God, so yeah. much jealousy and so much envy and you know almost makes that his entire personality um but he is just this gross person at his deep core um because of that obsession for power um and so that's why i try to add that david thulis type you know he's just He's the type of guy that likes to get inside your ear. <laughs> Lucas, I'm going to need you to make the ultimate sacrifice and not do and that. And just again. not do that. Are you sure? <laughs> yes. No. I don't know. No. That's up to you guys as writers whether, you know, you want uh, Phyllis to come back. So yeah. Honest to God, like, it's so interesting hearing you say this because, like, there's some other stuff, like, I wrote about for Phyllis, like, in terms of his backstory, where he comes from, and if half of the... Sh- shit he says is really like factual and not to be honest and it's just like hearing like your rendition of phyllis kind of helped like put that into fruition for me because you know hearing your voice and like really putting that on the marker now hearing your explanation as to like kind of everything behind it, i'm like oh my god this is actually everything that i thought this character is it's like incredible just like so awesome like you're like how receptive you are and like how you dig into the material. 
So I mean, you know, I I care about what I do, honestly, and you know, you guys, it it helps that you guys give me good material to work with <laughs> in the first place. Um, but I think I think that's what's the the beautiful pro- part about this process. You know, it's um it's a back and forth, and you know. Uh, there are plenty of examples where, you know, writers will write something a certain way and then an actor, um, you know, in a long running uh, sort of uh, program or show, um, you know, an actor's performance will suddenly change the way a writer uh, thinks about the character and then vice versa. Like the writer will go, well, I actually thought about it like this, you know, and that's this whole thing that we're doing. It's this is a artistic conversation, um, you know, where trying to communicate with each other in the best possible way to make the best possible product honestly i want to say though like when i was when i was reading the script and then hearing your performance i got a lot of like this is what renfield in dracula would be like if he had any like sense of ego or (laughs) any type of like hustle mindset i feel like completely i actually wow i (laughs) i never really thought about that like renfield angle um of being like the assistant, you know, whatever. Because, like, Renfield is such, like, a yes man in the Dracula story. Oh, my God. Yeah. Does but, like, eat bugs? That's up for you to decide. Actually, it's not for you. <laughs> I remember, decide. like, five minutes ago when we were, like, never <laughs> use that voice ever again. But it gives me so much joy. <laughs> Oh, wow. Well, thank you for joining us on this episode <laughs> of Merlin's Monsters. <laughs> it's over when I say it's over. I have the ego now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did have one question. Uh, it's not just about Phil. It's also about Sam. Um, yeah. So both of them are skeevy. Both of them make me I want know, to cry. About- uh no, Sam is skeevy. <laughs> Y'all didn't see the faces that Lucas made while he was recording Sam Taylor's lines. I, it made my teeth itch. I'll just, <laughs> it, it was <laughs> not okay. Um, I love it, Agnes. What, what do you think was like one of the most interesting, maybe most forthright differences between your takes on Sam and your takes on Phyllis? I think it's the different kinds of gross that they are. Because Sam, I imagine to be uh, someone, I mean, I know we've like kind of talked about this in terms of like what the performance wound up being in terms of not quite in Sally, but like, you know, just that uh, kind of um, outcast who just like keeps being downtrodden and, and, and stepped over and whatever, and he wants to make everyone else's problem his um because he feels like he is this just such lowly little bug and he wants to be like the big grand king in the you know so they're both vying for power they're both very much vying for power but um phyllis the way i approach it is that phyllis sees like true untold power in front of him um like sam taylor thinks he sees power you know, um, in the same way that is real, that in basically any one of us is experienced in one way or another of someone who probably, you know, like had rougher times and then, uh, you know, wants to abuse the power that is in front of them. You know, he um, like I have no doubt if Sam went up being a police chief or whatever, he would be very corrupt immediately um, because of the way he wants to attain the power in the first place. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a realistic sense of power, you know, a, a one that we are familiar with. And, you know, for Phyllis, it's um, it's eldritch. It's ethereal. It's um, he sees he can get this kind of power that like no one else really knows about. You know, he gets to be this monster. I think Phyllis is vying for power but i feel like sam is vying for status does that make sense i like that because i feel like for sam it's just he's trying to climb the ladder as high as it goes but phyllis is actually vying for tangible power right you know Mm -hmm. i yeah i fully agree with that phyllis i think likes to think he's the smartest guy in the room or like is the quiet one like kind of like that pen and teller sort of thing of like he doesn't really speak a lot but he's internally monologuing constantly 
Constantly. <laughs> that makes so much sense. And between the two, like Peter and Phyllis, Peter's the one who's actually smart. Oh, like, well, if we're absolutely. saying who is he's me. had hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of years of of wisdom and experience to you know, even though he's not really making the best decisions, he's been through so much. Mm-hmm. And then Phyllis is much like Sam, little shit. <laughs> Does Phyllis see him as an equal with Peter? Do you think Phyllis? Actually, you know what? I don't think he does. I don't think Phyllis sees himself as an equal to Peter, and that's what constantly upsets him. Mm. Um, he, uh, It's like a fragile like ego, uh, maybe a little bit of like uh, damaged masculinity sort of thing. Um, of like, you know, because when you look back on how we view werewolves, um, a lot of it can be viewed as tough. Aggressive, which is what we also see, uh, associate with masculinity and all that, you know. Um, so it almost seems like he's just a glutton for punishment. He continues to be emasculated um, in his own mind by Peter, um, and yet he still sticks around. Um, you could say it's because he wants that power, but I don't know. You're the writer. You tell me if uh, there's anything else beyond that. Well, I mean, I, I definitely think it's a little bit of both, though, for Phyllis. Like, I definitely, well, I always, I don't like to label, I mean, they're fictional characters, but I don't like to label them certain things, but I always sure. picture Phyllis to be really, like, a true kind of, like, um, very much just about himself and focus only on himself. And, like, if he's with Peter, it's for his own benefit and oh, for absolutely. his own good. She's so, there as a tool. Yeah, yeah. as a tool. And as a means to an end. being, you know, being, like, wielded that power of like oh my god dude like you can be immortal you could be just like me and he's like oh, i could just crush all my enemies so it really is also kind of dancing around to the end of that episode a bit like a question of did phyllis actually get that power so that's like the whole mystery of like who what turned happened? peter and like all of that so and who contacted did, phyllis and how did exactly. phyllis get a thing mm-hmm. to stab and yeah like, he's a bottom feeder and found after peter was like i don't want to give you anything peter uh, phyllis just himself. went phyllis just went to the next person whoever it would be and then went because again he's a little shit and spiteful <laughs> yeah. he just went all right well if you're not gonna give it to me and they will then fuck you i'm gonna stab you this is personal bitch <laughs> Now, we haven't even talked about the most skeevy character you play, you've played so far, the bartender. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> the bartender who Murphy unjustifiably get, calls so many names. It's like, all right, all right. <laughs> oh, yeah. How was, I guess that's another fun question. Yeah. It's like, how was it learning a Romanian dialect? It was really interesting. Uh, thankfully, we have a... Very, very insanely talented dialect coach in uh, Anton Correa. For both the uh, Romanian dialect and the uh, Irish dialect, um, he um, was so helpful. Uh, there's so many small intricacies in uh, learning, like the Romanian dialect, uh, you know, how so much of it is uh, towards the front of the mouth. Um, and I I don't think it's the takes that you use, but they're... Um, there's a much goofier take in there um, of my bartender role where I did a lot of really weird uh, ad libs and stuff, uh, <laughs> including like, I don't know, something about like, you know, oh, I listen to true crime drama. Are you guys like cops? You're supposed to tell me and stuff. So like. It's not like Hank from Barry. <laughs> Partially where I was like taking like some of the attitude from like NoHo Hank. <laughs> yeah, NoHo Hank. <laughs> I love I love NoHo Hank so much. Oh my god. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the the process of learning just like it was a great excuse to just learn a new accent. Honestly, you know, it was you know of course being part of this production is amazing, but like also to get something out of it on top of all that that I will use basically for the rest of my life because now I know how to do the Romanian accent because like it's you know in the way again shout out to Anton um, the way he simply explains it and the way he um, you know very kindly like broke down all the um, 
you know, uh, small bits to each like letter that's a little different, you know, it's like kind of Russian, but not quite, you know, like this, these ones are going to be over here. Oh, this one's like towards the back of the throat, et cetera. You know, it's, um, it's stuck in my brain. I I think what's been really cool on top of just all this uh, is just like being able to do that and stepping into the booth and just feeling like I'm really part of a, just production like a real professional production i mean i mean all of you at home can't really see what it's like here but they're you know it's it's wonderful here the equipment is fantastic and the people you work with are also yeah pretty all right but um i've i've been watching this um for years you know this 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 kind these kinds of things watching you know my mom bringing people into the booth and you know like especially you know for uh, other dialect type things where you know you'd have to bring in people who know how to do a certain type of accent and then you know uh you might uh, like bring someone in who like knows how to do the accent to like et cetera, you know, like to see that for so many years growing up and then to now look at what's around me and go, wow, like I'm doing that. Because again, we don't to go into a whole, you know, other ugh, track, but we lost several years of our lives, you know, um, to do the things that we all each individually wanted to do. Um, and, you know, for me, that was, acting and you know to give um an insight for you know i've told some of you about this um and you know for those of you at home um the industry is not really what it was um about like a couple of years ago um, people are not going in and going to booths people are not doing this people are doing things at home which to be honest we do partially do we do you know have people send things in because we can't always get people into the booth but um it's, you know, COVID has done such a terrible thing um, to the things that we're doing here. Um, and, you know, I, when I do do auditions and when I do, you know, uh, do stuff like that, I, you know, it's all just stuff from home. I don't really get to go into a booth and interact with the people that I'm familiar with or or have that sense of camaraderie where, you know, I'm just in a community. Um it's just not as much of a thing anymore. And, you know, as I, I consistently talk to my mom about this, I'm like, are they coming back? Like, are they going to, you know, bring people back into booths? Or is this going to be, a, you know, how long is it going to happen? And she's like, I don't know. You know, it might permanently be like this, which is a sad thing um, because a lot of studios are like, it's cheaper to just bring people from all over the country, from home, etc. Um, you know, of course there are studios that, you know, especially in LA and whatnot, uh, that do like to have people in the studio, especially when it's big things, you know, especially like, you know, non just commercials and whatever. Um, but you know, what we're doing here, um, is kind of, I mean, you know, not to put air in each of our heads, but it's kind of defying that. You know, um, I've I've told you guys recently that I think you all should be extremely proud of what you've done here. Um, and you should be, you know, you put the initiative to fight against all odds of what was against you. You know, it's it's hard enough organizing something like this to deal with uh, an uncertain, not really post covid, but post covid world on top of that um, made me feel like, you know, um, I don't know. It, it made me feel like I could be a part of all this again, you know? Um, and it's, it's a, that's a wonderful thing. And going back to Anton, um, I know that he also was the voice of Peter Borgo in episode yeah. two. Mm-hmm. Did you ever, you were, were you in the booth with him? Okay. Yes, yes, I so remember that. So do you, <laughs> I was one of his werewolf screams. Very good. Oh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So when you're in the booth with him, does he ever kind of stop a take and is like, you should be opening your like throat a little bit more, or like speaking from the top of your the roof of your mouth. Like, does he ever kind of go into dialect coach mode? Um, not really. I think Anton has a very good boundary uh, for knowing uh, when he is the performer and when he is the coach. You know, um, he knows that line very well. 
Um, and, you know, when he does, he offers it in the kindest, sweetest way of, like, you know, I, I don't even know if he's ever actually done it because, like, you know, he absolutely could have in, been in his right mind to do it because he's he has the talent. He has the knowledge. Um, but, you know, uh, I know with certainty, if he hasn't already, I know he would just, like, ask for it and be like, uh, oh, like, can I uh, just give you a little thing? Like, you're going to want to do that. You know, you're going to want to, like, open the throat a little bit more. You're going to want to put it, you know, forward. Um, but, no, nah, he, he just... Um, he just knows, you know. He he knows where he's at. What has been your favorite part of the process so far? Being able to just be in the show as as just uh, silly as it sounds, just do all these um, characters in this in this and be a part of this world. And you know, above all else, it's to just do it with my friends, you know, because. Um, like I, again, for those of you at home, because I often forget that we have an audience now. Um, we it's not just like us, just like kind of saying this to just like small uh, groups of our friends and whatever. Um, we are all friends. Like we all know each other. We have known each other for years. Um, and you know, the fact that I get to step into the booth and just perform and do that with people that I love and care about you know like it's not just like these are these are people who just asked me you know to do a thing because they saw me one time in a thing in college like we have been friends for years and have been there for each other through uh thick and thin in a lot of um you know a lot of good times a lot of bad times you know um and uh Alex, I have worked with you as a director before and, you know, for the rest of you, I worked with you as co-stars and everything. So to, um, you know, uh, uh, just repeat that process um, and just just get to play, you know, it's that because we want to just bring it right all back around to the top. Um, it's uh, it's the it's the sense of play. You know, and I get to play with my friends, and that's why I love what I do. Um, because that's that's one of the fucking coolest jobs in the world, man. That's like, you know, that's why I continue to want to do this, to be a part of these fantastical worlds of escapism um, that all of you sit together and in your own creative and chaotic absolute absolutely chaotic ways um you build and um you create and um you know we're really just doing the adult version of just sitting in a sandbox and slapping some legos together it's it's amazing um we're making something and that's and that's really beautiful and we get to do it because we are all moderately fond of each other you know, just moderately. Um, moderately. moderately. Yeah, yeah, let's not go crazy. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> um, I think there's something to be said too about the fact that, like, we as friends have been friends for. I was just talking to Alex about this earlier. We met like seven years ago, eight years ago, eight years ago. Eight years ago. Yeah. Years ago. Holy shit, year. right? I, which means that I've known you for eight years as well. Yeah. So, how I met Lucas, real quick. Please is do. That Please I go on. Had no internet in our freshman dorm. Um, so, and I was carrying around my router. And I was like, can someone help me with this? And I think you actually were having lunch with Derek. And I was ranting because the campus IT service was garbage. Yeah. And they just basically talked down to me the whole time. So Lucas was like, I'll help you out. And like came into my room and like helped me with it. Yeah. And then we just had a whole conversation after that. And like we've been friends ever since. It was the wildest thing and I'll always remember that. There is still there is something to be said about we've known each other for six to eight years, everyone collectively in this room. Mm -hmm. And um, the way that we've just been able to make an opportunity for ourselves to do something that we want to do and like love to do. Um, And it just feels very, very good that we were able to um, like launch this together as as people who again are moderately to mildly fond of each other. I met 
so many wonderful people and friends, a couple of which who are cast members on this show, including Addy. You know, um, there are a lot of things I say uh, about our college. When people say, you know, oh, do you regret going there or whatever? Do you, did you, what did you get out of it? Whatever. It's, I say that what I got out of it was connections. You know, it's, it's a, it's a, more a professional way of saying the friends we made along the way but like <laughs> but it kind of is because i have made connections with so many wonderful people who um i continue to be friends with and continue to play D with and continue to work on um projects with uh to this day including this very wonderful one you were one of the uh cast ma- cast members who was there for our initial script reads like our the workshops, our, the and, workshops yeah, and everything yeah. i was going to ask what you think is the most uh interesting profound maybe first one that comes to mind what is the most interesting difference between those scripts and the final product that you have heard and read today the most profound things that i've uh seen changed is um first of all how much you guys have learned um like how to structure a story you know and structure the scripts and everything you know because it was a learning process for everybody you know and to see you guys go through the process of like some of the early ones um where you know i think what's interesting is you guys really listen to the feedback that we gave and um you know you guys talk to each other and you know improved and built it out from there um seeing the first time it come together you know because like again because i've been there a part of this project since the beginning because you guys do occasionally leak murphy talk into our group chat again (laughs) which i am the only one who is not part of the production team sometimes there would be a meme sent out and i was and i'm like what is that okay (laughs) but uh you know to finally see you guys like put the script together, to see it, it, it grow and evolve from there, has oh. just been the coolest thing. But I think that's what's awesome is that now we're at this point when before it was like, you know, I mean it was real before, you know, like you guys were inviting, you know, actor friends that you knew to just uh, read this thing that you had created, um, and you know it was we were all having fun, but it it shifted from like you know we're just doing feedback on like a fun thing or like whatever to this is real. This is a professional um, production. It's real now. Mm -hmm. It is real. And, you know, as much as we all joke and goof and gaff that, you know, when we say, oh, it's professional, like it's professional. Like we have, you know, especially shout out to Dennis who, you know, it does so much work to uh, continue to make this sound and feel even more alive. Um, It's just everyone's worked hard to make this, again, real, but it's it's still just a fun, silly thing that we have created together to just have fun doing, you know? Play, that's really what it's all about. You know, as, as actors and writers and directors, we're, you know, sometimes we can get in our own heads uh, or up our own asses about it, you know, but we're just playing around, you know. Um, and I think the fact that we are able to um, be friends and, um, you know, goof around with each other uh, alleviates so much. Lucas, thank you so much for being here. Of course. Um, always, always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for, like, letting us in on all of that that's you're just an awesome person (laughs) thank you (laughs) um and so for anybody all of our listeners um thank you for listening as well um you can find us on instagram twitter uh facebook at merlin's monsters um spelt exactly the same way as the podcast ha ha um and keep your eyes and ears open for the following episode of murphy which will be released soon we promise Um, but until then you can catch up on all the previous episodes if you haven't already. And if you didn't, I don't know why you're listening to this first. Um, but thank you. (laughs) Lucas, is there anything you would like to plug? 
I will plug. Uh, I am part of an uh, improv group yes. um, called Loose funny. Corn. Yeah. Um, uh, we are Loose Corn. Uh, find us at uh, at Loose Corn Improv uh, on Instagram. Uh, you could go see us do uh, shows uh, on the occasion and uh, have a goofy, silly, fun time. You can also find Lucas on Instagram. Yes, uh, at Lucas Yudman, L-U-C-A-S-Y-U-D-M-A-N, because I always have to spell it to people. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, friends. Um, thank you once again. Thank you for listening, and uh, have a great day, evening, afternoon. Or yeah, whatever hasta time you're at. La pasta. Hasta yeah. la pasta. <laughs> Bye-bye. Oh, <laughs>